GPS gets you in the ballpark, but microlocation gets you all the way to the nearest centimeter. I'm Tanya Hall for ZDNet and Tech Republic, and joining me is David Mendel, co-founder and CEO of Humanix and professor at MIT. Welcome, David. Thank you. Nice to be here. What does Humanix do? So Humanix is the first four letters of human and the last four letters of robotics, and we make very high precision navigation systems that allow us to navigate within the built world as a way to connect people, robots, and infrastructure. So think about GPS, which has changed the world and tells you where you are anywhere on the surface of the globe uh, within about 10 meters, um, but it has a few drawbacks. It doesn't work in cities very well, doesn't work indoors, and doesn't work underground. What we're doing is building navigation for the built environment cities, nav uh, indoors, underground, um, navigating the built environment down to the centimeter and even down to the millimeter. So all the cool stuff that happened when GPS was deployed and got married up with cell phones and the internet, um, imagine that uh, in an indoor environment um, uh, uh, today down to the centimeter and not too far from now down to the millimeter. And so we see microlocation, as we call it, as the glue that will hold systems together comprised of people, robots, and infrastructure. So eventually there's a world of driverless cars and cities. Today there's worlds of mobile robots driving around factories and automated ports, and um, none of these things have an easy time figuring out where they are. That's the business we're in. Let's drill down on something that you just said. Why doesn't GPS always work in the places that we live and work in? What are some of the software tricks our devices use to mitigate some of those limitations? So um, GPS, first of all, it's generally good to about three to 10 meters. You know, that's bigger than the room I'm sitting in right now. Most people spend most of their workday within a space smaller than that anyway. Um, and GPS works by radio signals from satellites. Um, in order to make the phone that you use very small, those radio signals are very weak. So they're very easily jammed. They bounce off other things in the environment like buildings in a city or they bounce right off the roof above your head and they may well not go through at all. And um, there are a whole bunch of software tricks that we use to kind of mask this, like the, um, your car will sort of snap to the nearest road if you're going down the road and you know, the, the software does a pretty good job of snapping you onto the road it thinks you're on may or may not be the road that you're actually driving on. I'm sure people have seen that. Um, sometimes they give you that big blue circle of uncertainty. Uh, in New York City, that blue circle is the size of a city block, and your Uber driver is all the way on the other side of the block, even though it says she's in the same spot that you're in. The reasons for precise location information are obvious for military and also many other industrial applications, but what are some of the examples or use cases for isolating consumer location down to the fraction of an inch? Um, well, think about all of the valuable data that's in your motion as a human. Um, so even as I sit here talking to you, uh, if I was measuring the position of my wrists or the position of my glasses, um, there's an immense amount of data, and I use this as a demo, actually. Your, your heartbeat is in there, your breathing is in there, and your talking and your gesturing is in there. The millimeter accurate data is just tremendously rich, and we're only beginning to mine it. Um, but to be very concrete, think about augmented reality. Today, I can put on an augmented reality Google Glass or uh, HoloLens type uh, lens, and they're very poor at understanding just what it is you're looking at. So they'll, they'll give you your Microsoft Windows desktop hanging in front of your face or your user manual or maintenance manual. Those are pretty useful applications. Uh, but one of the things we learned from heads-up displays in aircraft is that for augmented reality to be really valuable, you really want what's called conformal projection where the, 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 the world is really projected onto what you see. Um, when you have your glasses, uh, navigated in space to the millimeter, it means you can orient them in space to the millimeter, and that will open up the whole world of augmented reality to be true augmentation and not just, you know, the maintenance manual, so you don't have to look down at the desk. I'd like to talk about a real-life example. How, how did microlocation improve safety and performance 
in the New York subway system? So uh, right now the trains in the New York subway system, uh, most of them use uh, positioning sensors that are nearly a century old. Um, they use what's called block signaling, where uh, each block is like a quarter of a mile long, much bigger than the train. And if there's a train in front of you inside that block, your train can't go anywhere near that block. And uh, that's for safety. It's, it's pretty safe. It's a good thing. Um, but it means that um, if you go to New York City and you ride the subway, you'll find the, the train stops in the middle of a dark tunnel, not infrequently, um, especially during rush hour. That's because there's a train a quarter mile ahead in a station loading and unloading the people, and you have to stay that far away. Our sensors are in advanced state of trial. We, we did about two miles of subway tunnels uh, this past fall, and we're doing about 10 miles uh, in 2019, um, where we, we uh, navigate the trains down to the centimeter. And um, that just opens up a whole new uh, uh, world of safety when you really know where the trains are. Um, you're able to bring them closer together and you're able to therefore improve passenger capacity. That's the thing that really matters during rush hour without digging any new track. All you do is put inexpensive sensors next to the, the, tr the train. You put some basic, almost driverless car type smarts on the trains themselves and uh, they just become smarter and it's a way of very inexpensively improving the capacity of the system. What are the shortcomings of existing location technologies like machine vision and LIDAR? So uh, machine vision, uh, first of all, it's vision, so it doesn't work well in the dark. Um, it, it's very sensitive to lighting conditions. It depends on a fairly uh, 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 data-intensive three-dimensional map to find its way. Um, LIDAR has similar issues in that um, it has to operate within a structured environment so it can find its way around the structure. Uh, neither one of them works well when there's mud on the lens. Um, and both uh, vision and LIDAR have trouble in weather, um, rain, snow, fog, uh, those types of, of environments, or bright sunlight even in many cases. Um, uh, our systems use radio frequency signaling. It's invisible. It's about 100 times less power than your cell phone puts out and um, goes straight through all those conditions. Even if the sensor is dirty, it really doesn't care. And so it's just a much more robust, lower maintenance way to um, figure out where you are. Now, I'm not don't think that we'll make LIDAR obsolete. Actually, we'll make LIDAR much better. And if you can imagine what a LIDAR picture makes when it knows where it is down to the millimeter, it's a pretty amazing picture. So in many cases, uh, a lot of these different sensors are used together with a kind of sensor fusion algorithms that, that take the best of all of them together. But when we think about driverless cars or other kinds of robots operating around people in safety critical environments, you really want this base layer of absolute reference, shared coordinate frame, all weather navigation. What are some of the technological hurdles that had to be overcome to accomplish microlocation? So, um, you know, we measure the time of flight of, of radio signals, which basically they travel at the speed of light. And in order to resolve that time of flight down to centimeters and millimeters, you have to be measuring the equivalent of picoseconds of time, but you don't want to do it with a very expensive computer, so you have to invent some clever techniques to do that. Also, radio signals, as GPS does, they bounce all over the place. Uh, you're probably familiar with, you know, you may be parked at a, lot, at a light and your, your cell phone doesn't work well, and if you inch your car up, you know, one foot, you'll get a better signal. That's because of these multipath reflections bouncing all over the place. Those reflections can corrupt the time of flight and a precision distance measurement as well. And um, our systems are very, very robust to those kinds of reflections. But that's a challenging thing to do. And it's really only been in the last couple of years that you could do those kinds of systems at a cost point that makes them suitable for uh, larger uh, different kinds of vehicles as opposed to some very expensive military radar thing. David Mendel, co-founder and CEO of Humatics and professor at MIT. If somebody wants to connect with you, how can they do that? 
uh, they should come to humatics.com and you can see all about our company. It's the first four letters of human, the last four letters of robotics. And uh, there you can follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter as well. Sounds good. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here on ZDNet or Tech Republic or go to my website, tanyahall.net. I've got links to all my social sites. Thanks for watching.